we are now at the final, final panel, um, which is last but certainly not least. We move on to uh, the panel that's called What's Next in Tech? Um, Ana Gonzalez, earlier this morning, she talked about how she's uh, concerned about deep fakes. Um, in the cyber panel, a lot was talked about about generative AI, chat GPT, the rise of chat GPT, how will that affect cybersecurity. And so we are honored to have um, experts on emerging technology and how that is um, happening in this region with us today. And our moderator is FIU's very own Miguel Asensio, who is the program director for our cyber grant and our resident emerging technology expert. Uh, here at the FIU Jack Gordon Institute. And so, Mike, take us home. I know it's going to be a fantastic panel. Thank you so, so very much. Thank you, Leland. So, Mike, check. Thank you. I promise we uh, saved the very best for last, and we are going to deliver on that. Thank you all once again uh, for participating today and taking time and want to take a, a moment to acknowledge those who are also online with us today um, viewing, viewing these talks. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Sam Howell, who is a research assistant with the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for a New, New American Security. Her work fo focuses on quantum technologies, semiconductors, and artificial intelligence. We've got Martin Redrado is the Secretary of Strategic Affairs for the City of Buenos Aires. Prior, he has served as Governor of the Central Bank of Argentina from 2004 to 10, and also a Senior Economic Advisor for the World Bank. We also have with us Charlotte Betts. She's a Regional Technology Officer based at the U.S. Consulate General in Sao Paulo, Brazil. As an RTO, she is responsible for monitoring and supporting U.S. government engagement on critical and emerging technologies in Latin America, the Caribbean, and Canada. And also, we have Chris Ramon, who is an expert on U.S. and global migration policy. He has served as a migration policy consultant to several organizations, such as the Migration Policy Institute, George Washington, the George W. Bush Institute, the Episcopal Church's Office of Government Relations, and um, as the latest, he is now, uh, congratulations, a senior policy advisor on immigration for Unidos US. And uh, with that, I'd like to hand it off to Sam Howell uh, to start. Great, well, thank you very much for the introduction, Mike. Um, the Hemispheric Security Conference is always an incredible event. Um, and it's really a privilege to be here among such esteemed panelists. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the global critical mineral challenge and how concerns about the critical mineral supply chain presents opportunities for Latin and South America. So just to give a snapshot, critical minerals form the foundation of the digital economy and modern military power. They underpin everything from consumer electronics and household appliances to precision guided munitions and advanced fighter jets. They also form the building blocks of um, clean energy technologies like electric vehicles, wind turbines and solar panels, which means that secure and reliable access to critical minerals will be an essential component of any successful um, green energy transition. And because of this, demand for critical minerals is expected to surge over the next decade as the world moves to eliminate carbon net emissions by 2050. The problem is that China dominates the critical mineral supply chain. China is the leading producer of 30 of the 50 <coughs> designated crit critical minerals. Um, and China's dominance of rare earth elements is particularly acute. China accounts for 63% of the world's rare earth mining, 85% of rare earth processing, and 92% of rare earth magnet production. China has also demonstrated a willingness to weaponize its position in the supply chain. 
In 2010, for example, China cut off exports of rare earths to Japan following a maritime dispute. China also threatened to include certain products using rare earths in its technology export restrictions list in 2019 after the Trump administration implemented sanctions on Huawei. And most recently, China um, is reportedly considering prohibiting the export of certain rare earth uh, magnet technology to the US in response to the Biden administration's October 7th um, semiconductor export controls. Even more concerning, China isn't the only threat in this space. Uh, the pandemic and the war in Ukraine have also caused significant disruptions to the critical mineral supply chain. So in short, uh, the current supply chain presents the US and multiple other countries with unsustainable vulnerabilities. The good news is that Latin and South America um, have a real opportunity to step up to the plate and establish leadership in the critical minerals sector. So the Americas are major producers of several critical minerals, but I wanna highlight just a few that are really relevant to the topic of emerging tech. The first is lithium, which is essential for vehicles um, wind and solar energy storage and batteries. Demand for lithium is expected to increase as much as 4,000% over the next decade. And the region already supplies 35% of the world's lithium. Um, Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia are home to nearly 60% of all global lithium reserves. Uh, but a lack of infrastructure prevents some of these reserves from being commercially viable. However, the region definitely recognizes the opportunity here. Um, it's really been stepping up spending on lithium exploration activities. Another element that presents a real opportunity for the Americas is nickel, which also underpins EV batteries, um, super alloys, and a lot of geothermal technologies. Brazil hosts 17% of global nickel reserves and Colombia and Cuba also have pretty robust reserves. The region's also well positioned to contribute to the global copper supply. Um, copper actually hasn't been designated as a critical mineral, but it's a really crucial component in a lot of technologies. And Latin America accounts for 40% of global copper production, which is concentrated primarily in Chile, Peru, and Mexico with additional reserves in Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and Ecuador. Again, a pretty sizable increase in spending on copper exploration suggests uh, that the region recognizes its potential to adopt a greater role in copper production. In addition to resource availability, the region's mining sector is also pretty well established, which means it should be relatively easy to diversify into new minerals. Um, there are several challenges the region will have to overcome, however, to maximize its potential. Governments need to establish frameworks to attract more investment in mining and processing activities. Current levels of funding simply won't suffice to meet the challenge of uh, growing demand for critical minerals. Investors are usually deterred by environmental concerns, so governments will need to prioritize ESG initiatives. The region's been pretty proactive actually about putting in place frameworks for environmental licensing and regulation, um, but there's still a lot of room for improvement in terms of meeting enforcement and compliance standards. Another benefit of prioritizing and complying with ESG standards is that it should help secure the support of local communities. Uh, mining projects historically face pretty strong opposition from local communities in Latin America. 45% of reported mining conflicts occur in the region where mining activities are usually located near sensitive and biodiverse ecosystems, many of which are home to vulnerable communities. So engaging with affected stakeholders and working with communities to maximize the benefits and minimize the impacts of mining projects will be really critical to success. And just to wrap up, um, there's also a lot the US can do to advance 
Latin America's role in the critical mineral space, um, all of which kind of focus on communicating to the region that the US sees it as an equal partner and not just merely a source of raw materials. So first, I think the US should invite Latin American countries to join the Mineral Security Partnership, which it stood up last summer as kind of a coordinating form for resource rich and like-minded countries to cooperate on supply chain challenges and um, try to infuse capital into the mining industry. So Brazil and Argentina were invited to attend the first meeting of the Mineral Security Partnership back in September, but have not been invited as full partners yet. Second, I think the US should pursue bilateral partnerships on advancing green technology with Latin and South American countries. Um, a model for this type of framework could be the recent US and climate partnership. This would really help countries in the region build their overall technological capacity um, and advance just their ability to meet growing demand in the mining sector. And finally, I think the US can partner with resource rich countries to explore the use of emerging tech in the critical mineral space. Uh, quantum technologies is one example that could have really um, impactful applications to the critical mineral space. So quantum sensors could be used to explore for new resource reserves um, and quantum, com quantum computing could be used for um, optimization tasks. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Martin Redal, please. Uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you, thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure to share uh, this panel and to share the, the final panel of this very successful conference that is dealing with uh, a concept that is critical to us, that is looking at the Americas altogether, not Latin America, not South America, not the Caribbean, but the Americas from North and South with a common agenda on security. Uh, the, the, the critical element of this panel is how do we move forward in terms of uh, security in the hemisphere and what, in my case, Argentina can contribute to, to the partnership within uh, the Americas. And the two critical elements, one that just very well uh, discussed at this point, which is uh, critical minerals and uh, the effect that the triangle uh, between uh, Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile can contribute uh, moving forward, but also on 5G. Uh, when we move into the new technologies and how we secure our hemisphere, uh, the development of 5G in a transparent, basis and the need that our countries have to move into 5G in the near future, in the case of Argentina, it's gonna happen probably in the next year. Uh, we need to be sure that we, among the Americas, we are exchanging views, information, and that we are very clear about the security challenges that our region has, and in particular, not handling to a foreign power the capacity to interact in uh, the digital economy, in the information economy, and in dealing with all our security aspects. Uh, let me backstep for a second uh, in saying that uh, I have a biased opinion at this point uh, because uh, we are working in a, in a team with uh, a leading presidential candidate, and I'm going to represent that vision moving forward to Argentina. As many of you know, we have elections in um, uh, October 23rd, and uh, clearly, I think that we are at the end of an era in Argentina. Uh, and we have, uh, maybe I come in a common ground, a new beginning. We have many new beginnings in Argentina. Uh, but clearly, this is the exhaustion of a process uh, where um, basically my, uh, uh, my, my, uh, my profession as a former central banker Argentina has run out of credit, okay? So the only way we could move forward is by facing the reality of having a strong macroeconomic policy, but also a strong and common foreign policy. And we're working together uh, with uh, uh, a big team of Argentinians in order to have a permanent uh, foreign uh, policy moving forward from December 10. And we think about foreign policy in terms of three pillars defense, data processing and data intelligence and artificial intelligence, 
and obviously diplomacy and foreign policy. And those three areas, uh, we are going to move them together in terms of what are the interests of the region on what Argentina can contribute to the, the security and the development of, the, uh, of our continent. Uh, Mario Montoto, in the, his previous address, spoke finally about one critical element as we look at public policy in our region. And that is, and when I define what the foreign policy should be for Argentina moving forward, is a foreign policy focused on development. So every time you, you need to consider that most of Latin America and the Caribbean has a significant amount of our populations living below the poverty level. That probably uh, our, our continent, unfortunately, is one of the most unequal continents in the world, worse than Africa, in terms of when we look at the distribution of income. So each public policy, as we address it, should look at how do we further develop our population. Let me bring this to specifically critical minerals. Uh, it was very well said that uh, the US, when you look at Latin America, should not look as, look as seeing uh, uh, critical minerals as lithium as just being an extraction for our countries and not leaving any value added. So all our policies moving forward from December 10 will look at how we could build, bring, obviously, the rule of law, as it was said, obviously, a single exchange rate, obviously, transparency in terms of fostering the capacity of uh, foreign investors coming into our countries. Uh, but clearly, we will look also for incentives to leave value added within our countries, in particular in my country, uh, when we look at the development of lithium, how do we build batteries? Maybe we don't have the scale to bring mobile, uh, mobile batteries, but we have the capacity to, to bring static batteries. That is to say the ones that are used at home or the ones that are used at factories in order to produce energy uh, within uh, uh, our, our continent. The area also about 5G, what we have to assure is that we create more jobs to our people in Argentina. Uh, when, we, when we go on auction and clearly having open technologies, technologies that are competitive worldwide are going to be a critical element because one of the key distinctive factors that Argentina has, as it was said in the development of knowledge-based economy, uh, the capacity of our engineers, our IT people are second to none. We have 11 unicorns in our region, in, in, in my country, which is second to Brazil, only in Latin America and the Caribbean. So we are very well prepared to come on into the 5G generation and start developing products in the service uh, uh, knowledge-based economy that could be uh, very useful to Latin America uh, and to the Caribbean. Let me also point out the areas of cooperation or the areas of integration where I see foreign defense and security uh, policies moving forward uh, in, the next, uh, in the next years or at least in the next decade. One is our commitment to defend and protect the South Atlantic and uh, the and Antarctica, uh, which is, as you are aware, Argentina has been uh, with the United States, one of the first uh, signing partners of the Treaty of Antarctica in 1959. Uh, and uh, clearly the defense and protection, not only of our economic well-being in the uh, South Atlantic platform, that at this point uh, there is illegal fishery uh, going on, so it hurts our people and it hurts the defense of the South Atlantic. That should be a concern of Argentina, Brazil, and together with the United States. So I envision first that we come back to uh, joint exercises between our army and the army of Brazil and the United States, as we had many time, many many years ago but clearly the protection of the south atlantic and building logistics base uh, with a regard of the environment in antarctica argentina could play a critical role also uh, in this um, in this area we need to revisit our status as non-nato ally uh, major non-nato ally that argentina got in 1997 and clearly we need to reinvigorate that as we move forward uh, in looking at the challenges uh, in the region. Obviously, uh, there, uh, what we need uh, in terms of the re-equipment of our armed forces, 
not only in digital technologies, but also uh, in hard power. And of course, uh, we are looking there to a partnership that can allow us uh, to bring us financing. And one of the critical elements when we look at public biddings abroad is the issue of financing. And therefore, what we can work together with multilateral organizations uh, in, uh, in the US uh, and with the private sector in the US and with offices like uh, or agencies like Exim Bank uh, are critical also in terms of uh, developing this partnership within the Americas. The challenges are enormous. Uh, we need to step up to these uh, uh, new steps, uh, a new era that is coming in terms of the influence of technology into public policy because the old concept of sovereignty is really blurred when we look at cyberspace and cybersecurity. There is no more this uh, concept of the boundaries that we had before. So integration, information sharing, data collection, intelligence are also critical elements to building a better and more secure hemisphere for our people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, with, with that said, Charlotte, floor is all yours. Um, hi, good morning. Um, as Miguel mentioned, I work for the State Department. I'm a regional technology officer. And what we do is the RTOs are field officers that focus on transnational technology issues, promote regional cooperation and public diplomacy, and energize global technology hubs to accomplish the department's objectives. Um, I will highlight smart cities and AI solutions, telecommunications, and intellectual property rights and trade secrets. Um, so smart cities are an opportunity for cities to improve efficiency in areas like transportation, government services, and utilities, employ local workers to implement those solutions and stimulate the local economy through government works projects. Various elements of urban design, such as public transportation routes and placement of lighting, have a direct impact on people's lifestyles and security, in particular, that of women and girls. As I've seen with Brazilian cities, uh, officials responsible for public safety and security are pushing the smart cities agenda without necessarily having all of the information needed to make informed decisions. This leaves their citizens with the need for data privacy and human rights regulations. In Brazil, much of these discussions happen at a municipal level where funding is limited, so financial incentives are paramount. Embassies throughout the region of Latin America and the Caribbean um, encourage their host governments to evaluate smart city solutions where data collection and use could impact city functions, community members, and national security. Many new sm smart cities technologies use artificial intelligence to analyze the data produced by these systems and to automate systems that inform decision makers. AI tools promise tremendous benefits to citizens like having more breakthroughs in healthcare, faster transportation, more effective education and revitalized industries offering good paying jobs. Maximizing these benefits will require us to create AI systems that represent our shared values and push back on malicious uses of AI. The global AI economy is now estimated at one to $2 trillion. But in the next 10 years, AI is estimated to add an additional 13 to $15 trillion to the global GDP. That's larger than the output of China and India combined. In Brazil alone, there are over 480 AI startups, which is the highest amount in South America. But AI also presents new concerns that must be mitigated. Authoritarian regi regi regimes um, are increasingly using AI tools like facial recognition and predictive policing to maintain social control and repress political and religious freedom. AI can disrupt the global security paradigms and introduce new complex risks for conventional and nuclear forces. Machine-driven communication tools also provide new avenues for foreign influence. Industry partners play a crucial role in developing innovative solutions for cities. However, industry partners should play a supporting role and tailor solutions that are unique to the needs and circumstances of cities rather than selling a one size fits all solution. In 2022, Huawei expanded digital power operations in Brazil's energy sector, announced cloud storage subsidies for Brazilian startups and announced initiatives to bring Huawei cloud partner network to the Dominican Republic. The cloud network provides startups with up to $100,000 in Huawei cloud services. 
including hosting new applications within the cloud for applications like smart city initiatives and customized AI solutions with data analysis and facial recognition. A new Huawei cloud partner network was announced last year at Huawei Connect in Bangkok, which emphasizes partner competencies for relaunch this year. With Chinese tech experts or efforts bleeding into renewable energies, infrastructure, smart cities and university research and innovation, there's a growing need for human rights focused questions in key discussions and meetings. There are two initiatives um, that I've seen and I've worked with to collaborate regionally with scientists creating AI solutions, the private sector who uses these algorithms and the government who regulate AI through legislation. There is a responsible use AI consortium based out of Rio led by Dr. Marisa Farrow. Her consortium aims to critically examine the social impacts of AI technologies and develop recommendations for high tech and research based AI policies. This group hopes to bring Latin America and the Caribbean together to follow UNESCO recommendations on the ethics of AI. Jean Periche, uh, based out of the Dominican Republic, created Genia to formulate a regional AI strategy for Latin America and the Caribbean that will focus on building a regional network for collaboration and training. In Brasilia, Felipe França um, spoke to the consulate and the embassy um, about his role in leading the think tank uh, that supports the Digital Parliamentary Caucus with 100 Congress people discussing bills on technology and innovation. These efforts show that coordination and collaboration are advancing the digital agenda in Latin America and the Caribbean with limited federal attention. Responsible use of AI is a top priority for the private sector, civil society, and university researchers as it as the need to connect the creators of AI with the user and the implementers um, grows and to better understand the purpose of each algorithm and avoid incorrect use. Um, on telecommunications, I've had numerous discussions with on supplier diversity developments in 5G and the reception, the receptivity to open RAN integration. Um, though it is an exciting time in telecommunications throughout the Americas with 5G auctions um, coming up in Uruguay, Paraguay, and Argentina, um, there's still a lot of disagreements on spectrum pricing. Um, there's a lot of public um, hesitancy to accept more antennas, 5G, why do we need it? There's still a lot of those conversations going on. Um, as we know, 5G is transformative and it will be the foundation of the future digital, digital economy. To build an inclusive, empowered digital future that nourishes our values, it's critical to build our next generation of networks the right way. That is why the State Department uh, for the last four years sought to promote the responsible global development of 5G and next generation networks trust being the foundation of the success of 5G and future networks. Network users, whether they're government, international corporations or private citizens, need to be able to trust the telecommunication networks and some of the sensitive information and critical operation that rides over it. Um, though telecommunications operators want to provide a secure network, that argument doesn't get far when consumers care about downtime and network outages. Without financial incentives, the US and our allies are losing momentum. Through the industry-driven nature of Open RAN, um, countries throughout Latin America and the Caribbean uh, have a little hesitancy, but they are looking for a successful 5G standalone Open RAN pilot and test. So hopefully at my job as an RTO, especially in the Western hemisphere, is to um, propose Open RAN test beds starting in Brazil as a regional influencer, um, and hopefully that will spark interest in 5G open RAN pilots. As I'm sure you know, Chinese efforts throughout the region are very aggressive. Chinese companies and telecommunications sector reportedly submit bids that can be a quarter of the competitor price. Mm -hmm. Though many companies are aware um, that Chinese companies are not performing as per the contract or there are delays in delivery, um, smaller companies really look at that price point. Chinese companies are also pushing their way into tech sector by literally whining and dining smaller companies and making it difficult to counter this influence and promote US businesses. In almost all sectors, there's a lack of skilled labor, which forces companies to purchase algorithms that require large amounts of resources. 
when the people developing these algorithms have a racial or gender bias, certain members of the population could be incorrectly targeted. That is why it's important to collaborate regionally and track trends to bring subject matter experts' attention to these developing issues. RTOs strengthen the relationship with local innovation communities to build research and development and commercialization partnerships. We also work closely with the embassies uh, to amplify the mission objectives, and we work to connect local tech hubs to the broader regional and global economic tech policy goals. Um, though there is a huge gap in university re research and innovation um, for the embassies in the region, I work with the DOD science officers like Army DevCom, Air Force SWORD, and the Office of Naval Research Global to, to better understand the grants that they're providing for university innovation. Um, the US has about 60 science and tech agreements worldwide. These include MOUs, exchanges with universities throughout the Latin America and the Caribbean, and RTOs are also looking into expanding research partnerships, understanding which countries have more research exchange programs, and more importantly, why talented researchers aren't choosing the United States. Some of the answers are simple. We don't discuss exchange visas. There are a lot of misconceptions that go unexplained, and due to legal reasons, um, those discussions are difficult to have. So we're losing out on an important research collaboration. And intellectual property rights are also um, a huge concern in Latin America and the Caribbean. Without the proper protections, this remains one of the top issues facing the private sector and university research. Also, trade secrets are a vital part of any developed economy. They provide the engines, both figuratively and literally, for many companies and the lifeblood that ensures continued innovation um, development and sta stability for local, state, and national groups. Yet these secrets are also a target for nefarious actors who take shortcuts at the expense of, expense of years and billions of dollars of research and development. Today, foreign intelligence services, criminals, private sector spies use traditional intelligence tradecraft against vulnerable companies, and they increasingly view the cyber environment as a fast and effective way to penetrate the foundations of our economies. So uh, in closing, without collaboration that builds on the expertise of both public and private sectors, technologies cultivated by our brightest minds and with our greatest universities are at risk to becoming the plunder of competing nations at the expense of long-term security. Thank you very much. And um, without further ado, Chris, so thank you all very much for uh, the invitation here. Um, very much appreciate it. Uh, Leland and I go back a couple of years. We met at a Fulbright conference. We're both alumni of the Fulbright program. I'm very proud, it was in Spain. And uh, I was at a dinner that I, a gala I organized in less than a month at the OAS. And I was running around and somehow I still made a good impression on you. So we're still friends after all this time. So, uh, but you know, I'm here to talk about uh, the intersections of technology and migration management. And it's interesting I mentioned the OAS because that's gonna figure a little bit in terms of just how we approach this issue. Um, migration management in my mind actually has three core components in terms of how I think about addressing the migration challenges that you have in this hemisphere or actually anywhere else, Europe for instance. And that's sort of three planks. One is obviously there's national security concerns, for instance, targeting uh, human smugglers and cartels. You have uh, roots causes works so international development, democracy promotion, addressing the stability that drives people, instability that drives people to come here. And finally, though, I think, and this is where I'm going to focus on, there's the migration management approach. Now, I'm a pretty big proponent of this, and it's been reflected in my work, including actually a report I wrote for the Center for New American Security uh, last year. And the idea for migration management, in my mind, sort of has three components. Uh, in order to create more effective and orderly management of migration anywhere in the world, you need three things. First of all, you need a multiplicity of different strategies to address the contours of the extraordinary migration event that you're dealing with right now. And you know, I think historically you've seen a lot of uh, a focus on deterrence as uh, saying, we're gonna stop them from coming here. That's one component, but you need to be addressing other aspects 
using different ways, including, say, for instance, legal pathways that allow people to go to different places, um, you know, depending on their needs and what they can offer to the country if they're doing it for economic based reasons. Um, but that is sort of the thing is that you just need different tools to address the challenge of the moment. The second thing is that you need to be anticipating what's going to be happening. One of the core failures in migration policy that I've seen in this hemisphere and around the world is it's always reactive. Um, and the thing is, an immigration event will happen. Maybe you'll get sort of sense of it maybe two, three, four weeks before, and all of a sudden the country is dealing with a particular challenge. And I think the, you can have better processes for managing it if you're actively planning for it and you're able to sort of say, where is this coming from? How can we deal with it? What tools do we need to deploy? And then that's, I think, one other way. The last component, and this goes back when I was talking about the OAS, is that it is coordinated across countries and across hemispheres. I think migration management shouldn't fall into one country. You need to be working together, offering the different strengths that you can do to leverage to manage migration events. And so I think that this is sort of the framework that I think about it. And I want to focus on one component of this for this conversation, which is um, you know, tools for processing vulnerable migrants. Um, Throughout this conference, we've been hearing a lot about the different push factors as to why folks uh, leave uh, for other destinations in this hemisphere. Uh, lack of economic opportunity, climate change, uh, a lack of human security because of you know, gangs and cartels. Uh, you know, I think that these are all things that, like I said, can be addressed other components with root causes work. But when you have large numbers of folks who are going to other places and seeking pr protection, um, you know, you, you have the whole hemisphere looking at this challenge and going, how do we address this? And I think that one of the challenges is that our capacity to process large numbers of individuals seeking humanitarian protection, not just simply the United States, Mexico, for instance, has been increasing the number of, um, the number of individuals seeking asylum status permanent protection there has increased significantly um, over the last five to seven years, um, actually probably eight years. And so the thing is, what you're seeing there is that you have a lot of folks who are seeking this protection. And the, the issue is that, um, and again, I, I always think more globally in this instance, is that we really have not invested a lot in our capacity to adjudicate large number of humanitarian cases. Um, you know, obviously, I think with the United States, uh, you know, the two core, like the two core bodies, uh, the immigration court system and USCIS, which are the two bodies that adjudicate um, asylum claims, um, we have made really poor investments into actually allowing them to be able to do their work. Um, Mexico struggles a lot with being able to process uh, refugee these uh, asylum applications to the point that they've actually needed to work with UNHCR to be able to provide support. And it's not just simply the United States. If you saw the, um, the opening of the European uh, migration crisis, one of the core issues there was with Dublin 3 is that under Dublin 3, the country of first entry needs to process migrants who are coming in. Greece really didn't invest at all in its asylum officer capacity. And then they were inundated with a large number of cases that they couldn't process this. But you know, bringing it back to this hemisphere, the question is if we haven't really invested in our capacity to process large numbers of vulnerable migrants, the question is, what can you do? So you know, obviously investing in the agencies and bringing on more individuals to do this. But I think that this kind of brings up, I think some three core areas of technology that are worth looking at. I was talking about things being anticipatory. Um, one thing is, can the hemisphere actually develop a cross hemispheric processing uh, ability to be able to know when you're gonna have extraordinary migration events emerging at any given point in time? That would require a lot of data processing, a lot of data sharing. There already is some data sharing on this, but there could be more. And so I think the question there is, how should we implement this? How can we do this effectively? So at least if we know that we're gonna be dealing with a large scale migration event, when involving, for instance, large numbers of humanitarian migrants, we can actually surge resources to affected countries to be able to process this. The second area, and I'm not gonna go deep dive into this, I'll leave this for a question, is applications for processing migrants. Um, we've been hearing a lot about CBP-1. Like I said, I will dedicate another segment for that. 
but you know, using applications to basically streamline the processing of individuals as they were entering into countries and basically making it more effective to say, here's an app, fill out your biometric information, your biographical information, you show up and you can do an adjudication a lot more quickly. The last area, and I think one that is much forward thinking is AI and the adjudication of humanitarian cases. As I was talking about, if you don't have human capacity to be able to process these cases, what role does AI have? And I think that this is an interesting area because on one hand, I can see the use of AI complementing a, say for instance, an asylum officer adjudicating a case here in the United States um, with processing the cases and providing some information as needed. The question that I think is going to be explored, but I think <coughs> will be a rigorous area of debate is, should AI replace an asylum officer? And I think that that is, brings in a whole host of questions. Um, you know, can then, how would you appeal a decision made by an AI um, process? Can you actually trust the information that the AI is processing? Can they make it a fair and effective decision? Who is controlling the AI? Where are you in the hemisphere? Can you trust the actors involved in it? Um, I think that that is sort of one of those things that's far out because, you know, I think in closing, one thing I will say is that like right now where the technology is, is that we are gathering a lot of biometric data, um, you know, depending on where you're crossing into the United States gathers a ton of biometric data and actually shares it with regional partners in Central America, for instance. And that allows you to be able to sort of track individuals. And that's, I think the legacy of sort of the securitization drive you saw after 9-11, we had necessary reforms uh, to be able to sort of uh, secure the, the process that we have and be able to track individuals who are coming in and out and so forth. But, you know, we need to be thinking a little bit more forward. And I think, like I said, with this specific area, when thinking about immigration policy, these are the three areas of technology I think will be interesting, but also I think raise a whole host of different questions. If you're sharing data, for instance, on migration patterns, can you trust the, the individuals that you're sharing it with if you're sharing it across multiple countries? These are all questions that I think people are going to be wrestling with but I think it needs to be wrestled with because if you want to have more orderly processes and more effective coordination across the whole hemisphere, you are going to have to lean into technology, but that means wrangling with a whole host of questions. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to kind of bring it back a little bit in, in light of the uh, CHIPS Act in the United States and some of the things that Martin was mentioning as far as collaboration and, and uh, cooperation between different nations. Um, we're looking at still issues related to supply chain logistics, right? And um, it's, it's only another matter of time before there's a, some other kind of event that also creates a, a severity uh, situation of a shortage. And it's not, it's, it's a hemispheric issue, right? It's not just a US issue. Um, and the minerals come in to play in, in that so importantly because these are the foundations. Now, cooperative-wise collaboration, what would it look like? And maybe this is a, a question between the, the two of you. What would that collaboration and cooperation, what can Latin and South American governments do to increase that investment at the same time to address um, the, the capacity issues of being able to manufacture and, and do some of those things on this side of the hemisphere, which there's very little in the uh, ability to do at the current moment. Sure, I can start with that one. Um, as I kind of mentioned during my opening remarks, I think Latin South American countries are really recognizing the opportunity here to step up to the plate and uh, play a leading role in diversifying supply chains. Um, but like you alluded to, the lack of investment is a real problem. So I think what they can do to attract more US investment is um, be really proactive about implementing strong environmental standards um, and bolstering their staff working on ensuring that those standards are being met. So um, have a lot of transparency about compliance and due diligence processes will help hopefully mitigate uh, the concern of US investors. 
Um, and from a US government perspective, um, I think one thing the government can do specifically in the critical mineral space to encourage investment is to think about it uh, like they've been thinking about semiconductors. So a few weeks ago, um, Commerce Secretary Romando gave a speech at Georgetown uh, when she was rolling out CHIPS Act funding. And I thought the speech was incredibly well done because she conveyed the national security importance of semiconductors and why US companies um, should be buying into this uh, national push to bring um, capacity back to the US. I think we need a similar effort and framing on the critical minerals issue about um, why this is a national security concern to generate kind of the rally around the flag effect um, that encourages US companies to play a greater role in uh, mitigating risk. Thank you. Thank you. Three things, logistics, logistics, logistics. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the critical areas where Latin America and the Caribbean is lacking the capacity to increase the supply chain among the Americas. And here, uh, um, well, what I see is that uh, two multilateral banks that are critical uh, should uh, work more closely uh, with the US in developing, I uh, mean, the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank are two critical levers that the US should uh, use in order to improve and in order to build the, the right infrastructure, the right logistics, so our ports are more available, so the, the um, logistic cost that uh, we have within the region. And uh, the other area where I believe we could collaborate is uh, the IRA, you know, the Inflation Recovery Act, which calls for uh, countries that have free trade agreements with the US have certain tax advantages in terms of uh, battery producing and, and the tax incentives that you have within the US. Well, unfortunately, not all the countries in the regions have free trade agreements with the US. So how could we work in order that those incentives in particular, when we look at uh, the two countries, Argentina and Bolivia don't have a, an FTA with the US uh, in critical areas like lithium, where you see the, the Northern Triangle in the Northwest uh, of our country and, uh, and Bolivia and Chile. Well, clearly that is an area where incentives could work in order to bring closer value added chain. Last but not least, two areas where we could increase the concept of security, energy security, as we said, in terms of moving into uh, greener, but also, uh, you know, how do we supply uh, energy to the world and uh, Argentina, the US have uh, the capacity and, and uh, of uh, to produce uh, shale gas, which is from fossil fuels, the less contaminating fuel. And as you know, there is a need in Europe at this point where the US and uh, Argentina and Brazil could work together in order to be another uh, source of supply of uh, natural gas uh, to the European Union that has made by one key strategic mistake in having only one supplier as it was uh, Russia. And then last but not least, food security, which is an area where, you know, all the, you know, in particular Canada, the US, Brazil, and Argentina have a, a massive weight in, in terms of the world economy and uh, coordination, not only in terms of um, uh, food production, but also in ag tech and the advances that you have in biotech uh, moving into agriculture, uh, well, those are critical areas where this continent, by having the, the four leaders working together, could also uh, mean a closer partnership moving forward. Thank you so much. And um, Chris and, and Charlotte, you, you both brought, brought up some, some topics uh, of an interesting nature, but, but first I want to start with, uh, you know, on this cooperative side, uh, with Charlotte, what are the biggest obstacles um, to international cooperation? What, what, do, what do you see there from that perspective? Uh, after that, then I want to actually give you both a joint question regarding some of the things that you just mentioned about AI and, and some of the other technologies. So 
So um, the biggest obstacles for international cooperation that I've seen um, is addressing some of the urgent environmental problems, particularly at the local level, uh, the lack of international financing um, that can support efforts at the subnational level and international financial structures designed to provide funding to national governments. Um, often that support doesn't reach the people most affected by those challenges. Um, and then another obstacle is non-tariff barriers um, to trade through restrictive rules and standards that hinder the use of innovative and clean US technologies. Yeah. And um, you also mentioned that, you know, at some point there are financial incentives and with that and AI coming, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, these technologies to identify, and then, you know, there's that fine line of, of ethics and what some of these technologies can actually do. We know several years ago, just before the pandemic, there was a, a Chinese company, Hikvision, that had a technology already to identify people and basically label them, whether they're a minority or, or not, based on uh, parameters. So, you know, my, migration, border, this human rights issues that, that are of utmost importance in, in preserving those things, where, where, do we, um, where do we find that common ground between uh, incentivizing not to use technologies that will veer us into a direction that may not be equitable or, or uh, justifiable from, from that point of view of, of discriminations. And yeah, that's a really good question because that is one of the concerns. Um, I think that thinking about the, the international framework around um, specifically in vulnerable displaced populations and migrants, um, you know, when you look at that, those are, those are treaties that are set in the last mid-century, right? Um, not even contemplating what the technology is. And I think that this is going to be one of those areas of discussion that I think will need to be happening both globally and also in the hemisphere in the sense of, are there any basic guidelines that we can establish on the utilization of data and the deployment of AI. Um, but of course, the thing is, it's always difficult. I mean, um, last year you did see um, at the Summer of the Americas, the, the, the signing and, uh, and the introduction of the LA Declaration of Migration and Protection, which is probably the clearest articulation of a global, uh, of a hemispheric mi migration management approach and a document that I think is, is really solid. Um, took a lot of negotiation, but we got there. <clears throat> so I do think that there is possibly the incentives for individuals to kind of look at this, individual countries and say, is there anything that we can tack onto the LA Declaration on the utilization of technology as a way to sort of have that conversation? But the thing is, there are different competing interests, the utilization of technology, where it is, how it's being used is going to be one of those areas of potential conflict or at least an area of intense negotiation. But the international human rights regime for AI and for the utilization of technology, I think is woefully inadequate. It's a little bit behind in terms of where the technology is moving. I mean, the market is moving, let's put it this way. The market is moving incredibly quickly. Regional local governments are kind of barely catching up. And then the international framework is even further behind, at least in thinking about this with immigration. So I think that that is the, the concern because like you said, um, it is entirely possible to use technology to create virtual fences or virtual walls. And I think that that is sort of one of those things in terms of navigating that. And like I said, in terms of migration management, what is the fine line in terms of creating orderly processes or ones that are just simply designed to contain? And I think that that's where I land on that. Yeah. And, and from a financial incentive uh, point of view, Charlotte, uh, you know, what, what is that? What could we do to improve that? Because in, in many times it is just so attractive that when there is a certain need, you know, to be have a, a, a competitor, a very aggressive competitor out there to undersell anyone and anything. And, and that creates a financial incentive in and of itself. But what does it look like from, from a regional uh, approach between all the uh, partners of South America, Latin America, and the US? What, what would a good uh, framework for that um, look like? 
So across um, critical and emerging technologies across the Americas, there's a group of government um, regional officers from DOJ, DOD, State Department, um, and even within the State Department, there, I'm the regional technology officer, but there's also regional China officers, there's regional environmental officers. So the first thing to do is to get together, discuss the challenges and how each of our organizations can best um, answer the mail. Uh, I think there's a lot of incentives with commerce. Um, you're talking about bringing attention to US businesses, bringing US businesses down to um, Latin America and the Caribbean to see where they can invest, bringing um, you know, late stage investing to startups. There's a huge issue with early stage um, startups moving into the later stages and expanding. There's not a lot of, um, unlike Brazil, there, there are other countries where there's not a lot of investment opportunities on that large scale, private equity and things like that. So to bring that attention, Commerce actually has programs where they will bring down um, US investors who are interested in providing those kind of financial incentives. But there's also the Chips and Science Act that um, there are parts of it that are divvied out, but one of them specifically says that we're helping um, the US, but also allied nations. And so if we can help in that regard, um, there's a lot of regional programs to inform and train but also if there's just straight financial assistance that's needed, um, there are mechanisms that we can pull on to do that. And some of the larger financial institutions like Exim, like DFC, um, they have modified some of their regulations to support the need for financial um, incentives in technology. <clears throat> the problem is the government can't buy equipment. Mm -hmm. um, and so that has been a hindrance in all of these pilots in open RAN pilots and discussing AI. We also can't have an opinion on which US company you go to. So that effort back at Commerce, um, they're going to put a canned response, um, a list of companies that do this and are interested in South America. And that's what we can go forward with. But some of those things you don't know until you get into it. Get it. Um, even with AI regulation, there's draft framework uh, in Brazil, um, that's still, I believe it's in the Senate, but there, that's, that's starting with the principles of AI and where they should go from there. What they have is the Portuguese translation from the EU. So when we come and we say you should do what the US says, because um, our stuff is best, uh, we do it in English. And mm. there's less than 5% of the people who live in Brazil speak mm. any other language. Um, so having that language barrier is a huge uh, limitation. So just presenting the draft legislation in Portuguese would help having those discussions in Portuguese, high level discussions, talking about cybersecurity, AI, 5G, Open RAN, those kind of things with all the different host governments, if that is of interest, definitely the embassies can um, help to uh, bring that information together and, and collaborate. Right. We do a lot of high level visits. <laughs> Uh, especially right now. And then in those visits, there's a lot of round tables where you bring the experts together and they actually say, this is what I need from you. And those kind of discussions are crucial. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'd like to open the floor uh, for folks in the audience who have a few more minutes left. Uh, if you want to ask any questions, please feel free. Um, I think I have, I have a, a question uh, to pose your way. As Argentina is at the precipice of a new era, uh, moving forward, what you know, and and you mentioned artificial intelligence as well, unicorns, and there's incredible talent in in Argentina, definitely from an innovation uh, standpoint, and we're seeing we're seeing some of that even here in Miami mm -hmm. with our our the growth that we've had locally in the blockchain, uh, crypto, decentralized mm -hmm. finance, those areas. I want to ask you, what does it look like? as we're, you know, AI is the flavor of the year for this year, and we're going to be entering into a quantum computing uh, era as well. What can, what do you envision? What do we start to do today? What is the action item with, with uh, Argentina and, and what's in store for it? Us in this room, give us that charge. What does it look like that we go back and we say, this is something we should follow up on? 
Well, uh, clearly the human talent, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there is a uh, significant, when you look in particular at what you have developed in uh, AI in the United States and the capacity that uh, we have within Latin America and the Caribbean, in particular in human resources, what I clearly see in the case of uh, Argentina, Uruguay, well, uh, when we mention also there is a Spanish speaking part and the Portuguese speaking part and, and clearly language is, uh, is one critical element there. And uh, Argentina, Uruguay, Costa Rica also have been uh, critical in terms of providing human capital for the, the IT industry uh, for Spanish speaking, uh, even into, uh, into Spain, into what we could call Iber America. No? So uh, the capacity to uh, take uh, the uh, experiences that you have and how you have grown up uh, or you have increased, uh, moved the frontier, if I would say, in terms of technology in English speaking languages, you could bring that down to, to uh, uh, Latin America, but also in particular to these countries that have very world class uh, human resources. You have seen that our unicorns are trading in NASDAQ. Uh, in the case of Argentina, the number one country, the, that, that shows how the economy has changed. Years ago, it was the oil company that was uh, the major company in terms of market capitalization. Now is a marketplace uh, called Mercado Libre, which is the, the, yeah. the company that has higher uh, market capital, uh, capitalization, that it's in Brazil, that it's in, uh, as I would say, if I may, the Amazon of uh, Latin America. Well, how we could leverage of, uh, of what you're doing in terms of the frontier, bringing into Spanish speaking content, I think that's where we could have a perfect uh, uh, synthesis of our talents moving forward. Thank you so much. And uh, we have a question on the floor here. Hi, we have a virtual question. Um, it'll be with Chile's recent announcement on their national lithium policy. What challenges will this present for the US? Should the US collaborate more with other countries part of the lithium triangle? Right sure, I can take a stab at that one. Um, I think this just presents a new opportunity for the U.S. to engage. Uh, I don't think it's too late to engage. Um, as other panelists uh, yesterday alluded to, China is investing really heavily in the lithium triangle. Uh, I don't think it's a particularly prudent strategy for the U.S. to try to match China dollar for dollar. Um, I think instead the U.S. should focus on um, reaching out to these countries and emphasizing, again, that we're not just there to seek raw materials. We want to leave behind some value. Yes. Yeah, one, one key comment uh, in particular, uh, again, Chile has laid out its uh, uh, lithium and, and the, the capacity to, to develop a state-owned company uh, as they did with copper. In the case of Argentina moving forward, we will want to develop the private sector, but we want to develop a dynamic private sector that creates jobs for Argentinians that really moves into the value added chain. So our approach, you know, every country has its different approach, is basically creating jobs through the private sector. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, with that said, I, I'd like to also, again, acknowledge the Center for New, uh, New American Security for helping sponsor this panel today. And a round of applause to our panelists. Excellent uh, job, thank you so much.